Kia ora and welcome to the Hockey New Zealand Exploring Coaching Podcast. These podcasts are an exciting opportunity for our local coaches to hear from experienced hockey people about all things coaching. Our intention is that you'll pick up what you like and give it a try for yourself, hopefully fueling your own development in our great game. Today we're going to have a chat about coaching the fundamentals. The panel and I will look to unpack some of the factors you may want to consider when you're setting up your own sessions. We're going to have a chat about things such as planning, questioning, and reflection, and also hear the odd story from Butch and Mark too. So sit back, get your cuppa ready, and enjoy the ride. To find more information about coaching in our podcast, head over to the Hockey New Zealand website and click on the Get Involved in Coaching tab. Follow the links from there, and you'll have everything you need. With that said, settle in and enjoy the podcast. G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Exploring Coaching Podcast. Again, we have our esteemed guests of Mark Walkers and Jason Butcher, uh, along with myself to to keep these guys under wrap and make sure we don't go down some somewhere we shouldn't go. Uh, today we're going to be exploring uh, coaching the basics and fundamentals within hockey uh, and explore some of the ways that we can do that effectively to uh, bring the most out of our, our coaching sessions for our athletes and, and what their needs are. So what we'll do is start, start us off as we're going to get straight into it. Uh, I'm going to ask these gentlemen, what are basics or fundamentals and why are they so important? Butch, uh, Monday morning, I think you can start. I was trying to create some space for you to jump in, mate. So what are fundamentals? Well, it's, it's one of those words we, we use, basics, fundamentals, um, and I guess what we're talking about are the core things that allow you to, to play the game with confidence and some level of competency, I suppose. So if we look at how the game works, you've got to be able to get the ball, so tackling, receiving, um, and you've got to be able to either move the ball or share the ball. So that's your, your dribbling or carrying and your ability to pass. Um, that would be my quick take, I suppose, on what I think fundamentals are. It's a tricky one, eh? Because um, usually, when you start to talk about f- fundamentals, then um, the the conversation um, sort of automatically shifts to the technical part of the game. So how how you hold your stick and um, how to push a ball and receive a ball. And I agree because actually, that's what you need if you want to be able to play in whatever way, a structured way or a, well, just a playful way. With a with a free mind, just kids amongst each other, and you know no guidance. So, but then the question is: Do do fundamentals also um, include mental or physical or um or, or, or technical? Uh, sorry, tactical components. Because if you cannot walk, can you play the game? <clears throat> yeah. Goodbye, you on Monday, mate. I, I I actually I was thinking that as you started speaking, like some of the some of the challenges in sort of development hockey where you, you're trying to help um, kids or even older developing players learn the technical the fundamental stuff, but then, you know, pos- how to play positions so you can play together. What does that look like? Um, sort of job descriptions in terms of um, how you contribute to the team and everyone sort of knows who's doing what and you can work together. That was something we spoke about on the, on the last webinar. Um, and then, you know, basic understanding of the rules then the soft skills around relationships, how do you play together? Um, you know, there's, and then as you said, the physical stuff, there's you've, the functional movement, functional strength component relates to being able to do technical skills competently. And, and of course, if you take it right to the base level, you've got to be able to run, don't you? Um, and how does that tie into running around with a stick, um, executing things in awkward body positions? So it's, it's probably not as simple And you're right. We probably always go straight to the technical component um, as a way of just trying to get our heads around what the priorities are, I guess. It's also a matter of um, of age, I would say, because the fundamentals to an, I mean, if an 18 year old starts to play hockey, the fundamentals are different to when an eight year old or a 10 year old starts to play hockey, um, because you can dive into the rules and some of the tactics directly, which will help this person of 18 year old directly to play, well, a fundamental part of the game um, but then if you start with rules tactical components although basic um, you know with a 10 year old you know that might be too much of 
of information to process. Yeah, and it, and it's sort of interesting like what you mentioned about it depends on the, the person and the team and the group. I think that sometimes it's a complexity that we wrestle with when we talk about having curriculums, as an example. You know, when you're 10 years old, you need to be able to execute this skill. And it's like, well, it doesn't really work like that with nonlinear athlete development progression. And, um, you know, whether you get an older or a younger athlete or whatever the team is, I think the key first job is to recognise the context of where they've come from, what they know. Maybe they played basketball all their life and the tactical stuff and the spatial awareness is really strong. So you focus on the technical component. Maybe they've been dribbling around cones in whatever program they came through and their skills are pretty good, but they haven't ever really experienced or had a, a structured approach to how the game's played. Um, so that information is, is really important. And, and also the concept of it's not one size fits all and there, there isn't going to be linear checkpoints of anything. It's just not real. Yeah, this, this is really cool stuff because now, now we're getting somewhere, especially when you say, look, with, with those structured um, you know, plans, guidelines, when to do what, in the end, it's the context and the athletes that decide what needs to happen next. And although they don't know it, you know, as a coach, if you observe what, what is needed, what, what can they do and what is needed to, to you know, sort of um, take the next step, that, then you start to nail things. Um, so, so observing what they can do and, and rewarding that first, but then also challenging that, you know, to proceed to the next step, that's, that's where coaching comes in. So, and, and then if we talk about that way of coaching, then fundamentals gets actually sort of a different meaning because what, what fundamental is to you might not, have, might, might not be a fundamental to me. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting, Nicole was talking about self-determination theory earlier around how this fits into that and, and creating, not just with your knowledge when you observe and you feel like this is, this is the area for this group and these individuals, but then also working with them on you know, what they want to do and where their head's at with what they want to learn and, and I guess their part on the, on the pathway, don't like that word, part of the journey maybe. Um, so giving them, empowering them to be part of that observation about where we're at as a group. So it's a collective, okay, this is, these are the things we're going to work on together. Um, and it's not just coming in either one with this, by year 10, you should be able to do this, or I've coached like this forever and we're going to do this and making sure we don't keep just planting those arbitrary things on top of people and the experience that they get. Nice. Uh, so I've just opened up a massive can of worms, which is, which is awesome. Uh, where I'm going to go with this today, guys, is I'm going to set a bit of a context for you. Uh, so if we're going to explore a little bit further, let's make the context around uh, junior players and junior coaches that are just starting the game. Um, and maybe some people that haven't done a lot of coaching or have experience in coaching, some of the tools that they might be able to use to ensure that they're um, treating the athletes and their development at the at the high in the highest way or the best way. So, if we go to that, um, what what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen or you've made yourself um, in terms of coaching fundamental skills, whether they be technical, tactical, social, emotional, all of those things. Uh, what are some of those mistakes you might have made in the past and what were your learnings from that and how have you adjusted now? Yeah, I'd like to start and um, I start with a story or an example. So I was um, at a turf and um, at one of the little playing fields, there was a father, it seemed like, um, trying to teach um, his, his daughter, I believe it was, um, like a, an upright hit. And um, uh, I always stop and observe from a little distance because I think that's always very interesting. And, and you could see that there was a genuine effort and, and positive you know, intent to, to teach his kid the upright hit. But now it comes. He presumed that he knew how she should do it. And... Um, so he started to tell all those things. You should do this and this and this. And I was just observing it. And, and, and I could see that what he was explaining was absolutely not helpful <laughs> in, um, in creating a good result, you know, f for that little girl. 
and and I, of course I don't intervene, but but this is this is like the core message. Like if you don't know it, don't start to sell rubbish. So better to ask questions. So let the kid hit the ball, and maybe you know, oh, the, she hits the ball pretty well, and um, you just start to observe the body. And and I think we should go into that. So if you know how to be able to observe a movement, which is not science, I mean, break it down, break it down to an upper body, uh, the legs and the hands. Um, I mean, that will do for a start. If you just observe that, then you can can make suggestions. Yeah, so I'm oh, OK, so if you maybe hold your hands a bit more like that, what will happen then? And OK, give it a go. And then if you see that the result is actually not, you know, as you would have wished, or oh, maybe just, you know, oh, what if you would do it more like this then? What would happen then? Instead of hold your hands like that, put the ball there, and then actually selling all rubbish. Um, because that's how we create actually worse hockey players than they would have been without coaches. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, um, that's my story of the day. Yeah, I think that would probably resonate with with most coaches. I suspect as they go through a journey with skill acquisition and how you support that. I think the first thing you do is you try and understand skills, and there's also resources and documents that have this reductionist approach where every little detail is sort of pulled apart. and And you talk about hitting it's left foot here, ball position here, hands here, elbow there, shoulder, all, all these things. And when we try and coach like that, we just blow people's brains apart. One because they can't fluently they just can't piece that together in one action but also we we're forgetting that everybody is their own unique life form or form of life and they'll all have different things tall different strength points different sort of attributes maybe they're good with their hands all these different things and as you say mark the, the key is to essentially just let them go and then start trying to leave breadcrumbs around experimenting exploring different things that will start building them a technical model that will work for them which won't be the same as everybody else. There are, of course, I, I like the, I've sort of latched onto the concept of invariant and variant components in skill in skills. And the invariant ones for me are the non-negotiables, like there might be how you carry the ball, what you do with your left hand, or the obvious one is your left hand goes on top of the stick, right hand um, halfway down. So there's things which are non-negotiable. And I think in most skills, for me anyway, there's some two or three really key things that they're just not going to change because they're the most proficient way to do stuff. Um, and then the, the variant component is these are all the things you can explore and adjust and adapt to fit what works for you. And I think that's a nice way of framing it for people. So it's not just go and swim in the ocean, but we're not going to teach you how to swim and you'll just figure it out. But give them a couple of things which are really important that can hang the rest of their own exploration off. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's really cool, actually. So um, I like I liked uh, how you kind of alluded to breadcrumbs. So that's kind of just like leading them down a path to get to the the, the cookie house at the end of the road, you know. Um, so that's really nice, a really nice analogy. Uh, and also picked up about the non-negotiable skills and uh, variant components for the individual, which which is still allowing them to be creative and, and have their own personality on skills, which I think is really, really cool as well. Um, so I don't want to really go into nitty gritty about certain skills because we're going to be here all day if we if we start to do that. But I think that frames it up quite nicely, Butch. Um, have some non-negotiable uh, elements to the skill acquisition. So it might be hand position, you know, just for a hit versus a sweep or a push or a trap. Um, and then you have your variant components with what hit or what foot you hit on it. Uh, you know, people are different, so they might be lefty or righty or you know a little bit more backhand dominant. So to speak, so you know, allowing some sort of room to move in there, I think, is important. Um, so with that, with that, what does that kind of look like when we're setting up a, a, a training, a training around the basics? Um, how how we might frame that up as a coach to to allow our athletes to have their non-negotiables, but also find some some creative or individualistic um, elements to their own skill acquisition. So how might that look like in a training? Well, we can be very creative here. So an example I'd like to share in the Netherlands, I, um, I worked at a club where um, almost all players were playing hockey with their hands together. 
So even when they were dribbling, so they just did everything with their hands together. And obviously, well, we would both agree that it's not the right way to hold your stick when you dribble because it's not efficient. But, you know, to let 500 kids know that that's not the right way is not really going to work. I mean, they've sort of, well, um, um, it, it, I mean, they think that was normal, that they think that was the way to do it. So what I did is um, I just bought a few basketballs <clears throat> and I let them play a game with a basketball. Well, if you keep your hands together, you will break your wrists. So automatically what happened is that they were doing their hands, hands apart. Um, and, and that's just an example that you can actually use as a coach. So, hey, you observe something, all right, you have the tool to tell them, hey, maybe you want to put your hands apart, or you're going to force it sort of up to them by using different materials um, or maybe shaping the rules differently. This is just one example, but it works. It works. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the other the thing that this takes me to is I'm, I'm a big sort of advocate of the ecological approach or constraints-based learning, use some big words, but and that's a great example, Mark, around how you can still have game-based play stuff that uh, creates those opportunities to, I guess, be more aware of the different um, pros and cons of, of how you're doing certain things. Um, one of the things that I think we miss sometimes when we're on this journey of trying to push everyone into more um, game-based play and constraints-based learning is that we forget that you still need repetition and you've got to find a way um, that works that can be transferred to the gameplay as well that actually builds skill acquisition. Um, I, you just, I don't think you can do it by just chucking, especially developing players straight into games all the time. Even if there's lots of touches and there's good design around what you're doing, you still need repetition. I think the conversation around what that looks like is, is a really interesting one. Yeah, I like that. Um, so repetition is important, especially for those fundamentals. Um, but then how do you train that? And usually the, the, the simplest way to do that is just to put two people in front of each other and, well, have a go on whatever you want to practice there. Um, but then there's also a disadvantage because can you make it more fun? Um, can you create game components within that? You can, uh, but you do have to think about that. Um, what is the body actually doing? I mean, if you just put two people in front of each other, you might be able to practice a fundamental skill like a push pass, but the, the whole position of the body doesn't resemble what is needed in the game. It's always sort of moving. So what do you do there? And then the disadvantage might be that you start to overcomplicate things, end up with difficult drills. And then if you, if you actually time how often the kids are um, sort of repeating a specific skill, it's actually maybe in 10 minutes, three times and they're long cues and uh, people are actually just chatting their way, you know, through the drill, um, which you obviously don't want. So it's really finding a balance in between the two, I would say. And I think the, the the transference for me is like they talk about repetition without repetition, random repetition, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. But it's like trying to add enough variability, even a bit of decision making, even things they have to sort of perceive and be aware of. So it's not just two people five yards away repeating a skill in zombie mode where they're going through the motions and you just got enough enough things they have to be aware of or think about so that you can try and embed and get them to be a little bit more deliberate about um, having some adaptability and some thought and exploration around how they're building that skill in their minds and, and the feeling within their body. Uh, so I think that's, that's another big part of that challenge as well. I, I love this. I mean, it's, it's a personal, it's a personal topic as well. Um, but the, you have to bring in some sort of cognitive challenge. Um, if you don't do that, it's just, you know, robotic re repetition of something. Uh, the problem is as soon as you put pressure on it, they won't be able to execute as well, which will happen in a game. Um, so that's why I'm not a big believer of, um, training technical skills purely 
and solely in an isolated way. Yes, to just get started, but then soon move to a drill where, oh, look, work with different colors of cones and give them cues. I love to train with lights in the dark. I mean, that's a new standard, but um, um, just those sort of those things that could trigger the brain because how it really works, sometimes we forget that we think the body works, but it's the eye observes something, the brain processes it, and then the body executes it. So if we forget about the eye and the brain, then we're not doing a complete job. So to summarize that, it's all about decision making, but decision making you do by observing something and then processing it, and then a movement comes out. So if you don't include those two, uh, I don't think it's a very sustainable way of training athletes. Yeah, the, the closed skill stuff is problematic if you hold it there and only do that because it, it doesn't transfer because of all the things you're talking about. Um, a thing for the listeners to, to look up is a thing called perception, action, coupling, and that's essentially what you're talking around, perceiving, processing, and then being able to act. And that's essentially what the act of the skill execution is. And without those leading things in your environment, um, apart from the early stages of just getting some feel or competency of how it looks, uh, then you're not really developing that skill if that's all you do. Cool. So Thank we're you. starting to get somewhere. Sorry, but I'll just jump in there. So um, the word that I like to, or the words that I like to use is that incidental repetition. So through design. So you're kind of creating your activities around having an element of repetition, but then adding in those things that you've talked about, which are, you know, making sure there's, they're engaged with time on task, having some fun, decision-making, and a little bit of challenge. Um, because what, what can happen real quick, especially with young al- uh, athletes, is they lose, they lose uh, their, their concentration quickly. So they need to be stimulated in a way that's going to challenge them and make them feel like there's there's that cookie house at the end of the road, as you say. So really nice. It's really cool to start talking around this stuff. And and now I suppose where I'd like to hit it is, you know, if we're talking about session design or, you know, a young coach, new coach getting into a situation, they know the skills they want to, to try and start teaching their athletes. Uh, in that planning phase of the, the training, what what kind of things can coaches be looking to do or obviously thinking about the things of uh, is there any examples that you've got that might hit a few of those things on the head yeah and i think the first thing is it's not it doesn't have to be complicated and maybe it's a bit like apple's design phase where all the work goes into you know planning something simple but there's so there's still a lot of thought and so forth around it but um, as an example there's a couple of things we're doing here at the moment which are just a lot of repetition and then just adding variables as you get a feel for how they're going. So we'll we'll do relays where you'll have um, 25 to 25 and you'll have maybe six in a group. So there's not lines, they're constantly active, little, little rest. And we'll just change things. It might be ball carry position, trying to get your head off the ball. It might be prop in the middle, drag backwards, left to right. Just every t- every sort of few minutes, we'll add different elements and change what they're doing. And all they're doing is skill going through. And the fact that there's it's constantly changing means they've got to, they're not going into sort of an autonomous place or a zombie place where they're not thinking about things. Um, so that's an easy way to get a lot of repetition. And you can pretty much get a feel for that or just change on how the group's going, make it harder, faster, add elements in um, that they're, they're struggling with and so forth. And the other simple one, which is a bit more group, which is about engagement and concentration, we've been doing is just a... It's like a circle, it's got five points, and we either make them pass to the second group on their left or right, we change that up so they've got to be thinking, and that might be a stationary receive and pass and then jog through to the group you pass to, or it might be you carry on a certain distance and then you have to make a certain pass. Could be you've got to track left and make an upright reverse stick pass. Uh, then we can put two balls in, so they've really got to be switched on off the ball and engaged. So you can keep adding these elements, and all you've got is a simple um, group of five in a circle where they're having to think about and remember what the passing pattern is, which is going to change again, and we're constantly changing the skills. And the other thing is there's always people crossing through the middle of this circle, so they've got to be aware, and every time it's different because they might have to slow down or drag right. Uh, so I guess my point is from those two examples, you, you don't have – it's not a big complicated follow the pass, lots of witches hats. I pride myself on not using hats ever, but I think if you th- – 
smart about the design and you're not trying to be too clever and it's just about repetition and little subtle little variables that make them concentrate, make decisions, be aware, engage in the whole time. Um, there's a lot you can get done with some really simple stuff. Yeah, I like the the distance component, the the time component, the what you can what you can do on the left, you can also do on the right, and vice versa. Um, and, and I like the physical pressure component. If you just you know jog around with and, and play around with those sort of four components, you can already start to create interesting drills without what you say using cones or whatever. Um, yes, yeah, so I like to call those modifiers. So you know, once you're in that design phase of your activity that has skills and, and uh, movement and decision making, all those great things, having a couple of backup plans uh, in case things are too easy or too difficult. Um, like as you say, Mark, changing the amount of time or space or adding extra movement, doing it on the left or the right, having those things up your sleeve as a coach are really, really good things to ensure that you have success in your training. Um, so I think, you know, in your planning phase, having a few modifiers for each of your activities is always a great idea. Uh, also, Butch, what you touched on around the design and making it simple in application, I think is really, really important. Um, and it kind of, for me, highlights the fact that if you plan really well as a coach, um, you can kind of run some of those things through your scenarios in your head before you get out there. The, the difficult part is the planning part. That's the part that you know, spend the time there and you'll see the fruit on the other side of that when you're actually in your training. And and not always are you going to get it 100% right. So that leads to your reflection phase after after your training is reflect on those activities and were they successful? Did they hit the outcomes that you wanted? Did the athletes uh, understand what the outcomes were and did they, did they get the outcomes? Um, so I think we're starting to get into around that training session design, planning, implicating and then reflecting. Uh, is there anything to add on that importance of the things that I've missed there? Yeah, I think the planning thing's really important. And But I also, I, I feel, and uh, you know, Mark and I are lucky or unlucky because we put a few lifetimes of coaching experiences into our, into our brains, I suppose. So it, it sounds easy, right? But I, I sort of plan now pretty loosely with an idea of where we are in the journey for whatever team it is or and then and adapt on the fly and you know those modifiers and having the knowledge and experience about how you solve things or how you create stretch or how you bring them back a level those are the, the experiences that are really valuable to be able to make a training session great and to, you know for the group to take it somewhere where everyone feels like it was a really valuable you know hour hour and a half or whatever so i think understanding those modifiers and understanding the art of how you manage a training session to keep adding stretch progression no, it was too far. How do we go back a step but not do the same thing we were doing a step ago? All those bits and pieces are what makes that hour really productive um, and really enjoyable for everybody. I agree. Was my what was actually my my biggest work on as a coach. Dutch people like to control a lot, um, but if you start to write out every piece second of your training session, I mean it's just not. It seems efficient before you start, but you don't get out of the session. Or you, yeah, what you could have uh, get out of the session when you sort of move with whatever happens and be more agile and flexible. So yeah, on, on the same page, get your framework right. Know what you want to get out of the training session, and then there to yeah, move. Yeah, and it's uh, you know I don't want to advocate just turning up in your car and winging it because that, you know, then we'll end up doing two and ones on top of the circle. So you, the, the thought and the reflection and the learning, reading, watching other people, like that's how you build the experience so that you can adapt and, and do, do it really well. But I also think, you know, when you get to those scenarios where, well, this isn't working or we've got an extra number and that's too much, it's it's being not even brave, but being curious enough to go, okay, what will happen if we put a defender in this? Or what happens if we have the numbers even? Or what happens if we do this? And just try things. And if it doesn't work, you can quickly pull it back in. Or you can go, oh, okay, there's something there. Maybe if we tweak this. I think that's how you build the experience and how you, also how you build enjoyable training sessions. Because the group know it's not just bang, bang, bang. They know that they're part of this story over the next hour, an hour and a half, and then you're going to go somewhere together. The cool thing about this, what you're saying, is that you also show as a coach that you're not sort of afraid to make a mistake and that you 
sort of dare to explore because that's also the message that you want to send across to your athletes. You want them to explore and not be afraid to make a mistake. And that should be the same for a coach. The culture is still though that the coach should know. Um, but yeah, hopefully with you know, more people like, like us um, that, that will shift. And, um, you know, it should be a, a journey together. And that, yeah, you never know where it exactly goes. I, I like the, the story, the journey sort of words because they encapsulate, I, I guess, how I feel about all of that stuff a little bit better. Um, I really agree with the make mistake stuff. I'll often even make a point probably overly with certain teams that I coach when I've got things wrong because I think it's really important that that they understand that we're in it together and that you're not perfect and you don't know everything. And also, as you say, that you're on their behalf with them trying to find solutions and you're brave enough to try new things to see how they go to find the optimal place for us as a group um i think and i think you've said this in previous conversations we've had mark where you know as a coach don't double down and dig in that you were right um i think the the humility of that and and how your team see you as a leader i, I think it's it's a almost almost make mistakes on perfect on purpose if you're not making mistakes just to say to them look we're all um, we're all sort of um, fallible, or we all make mistakes, you know. So it's part of what we're doing together. Yeah, that's that's really nice. Um, it's definitely about building a trust and, and a genuine trust with your team. If you can be a little bit vulnerable, and and yeah, everyone does make mistakes, and that's a human thing to do, you know. And we're all part of the same group, so really nice, really nice kind of uh, touch there. Um, even though sometimes it might be embarrassing, that kind of just shows that to your team that, look, I'm here, I make mistakes as well, and, and, and I'm human, but we're doing this together. So a nice a nice kind of little factor of leadership there and, and what that looks like. Cool. All right. So we've kind of unpacked this quite a bit. Uh, were there any, any kind of examples that you can draw back on of a time where that more long-term approach uh, has really come to fruition? Um, so, but you just touched on it, you know, around uh, having a little bit of a long, a long term view of things rather than trying to get something out of a 15 minute session, you know. So, can you give us some insight into what that might have looked like in some of your environments? Yeah, well, I think the part of the start of this conversation was that every team's different and every timeline's different, and and also I change and grow all the time as well. So I don't, I don't think there is a, a one case thing, but. There's no doubt in my mind, my approach is is sort of where I've landed, or I certainly think it's the right approach, is that everything you do needs to be long term, because anything that has a short termism sort of lens on it or an approach with how we behave or how we make decisions as a coach is not in the best interest of anyone. And I, and I fully understand why we do that. It's because of ego and the weekend and parent pressure and all the stuff we need to win. And, you know, there's ways you can win at certain levels that are not necessarily productive um, for teaching people the game or for their love of the game. 100%, I can I can do that with any team. But the long-term approach means that across a year or a period of time or however long you have the privilege of being that sort of custodian position with that group, you've got to be mapping out the, the bottom layers of the brick that you think will set them up for a healthy, sustainable future in hockey, but also that are going to give them a base that's a bit higher for wherever they are next to keep exploring becoming a better hockey player. Um, and so the short term stuff is is the thing we've just got to be strong enough and good enough as people and leaders to just just to shy away from, you know, and the, the easy example is the under eight hockey game where you've got the big strong girl who hits field position and then you, you get down there and we put the fast girl here and and we, we don't want to pass or we don't want to shift the ball laterally or play with on angles because we don't get rewarded for that. So we're just going to hit it long. And, um, you know, so you spend a year winning some games of hockey. And then as you get older with that group, they haven't learned to pass. So they haven't learned off the ball awareness skills. They haven't learned how to construct passing patterns to create space to penetrate in better positions. All those things unfold because of this weekend warrior um, approach that we have as coaches. So I think that's that's a key one, right? Yeah, on that, yeah, I nice. think it's um, it's important to um, to write down, you know, what sort of topics you have been um, well 
sort of teaching them or gone through with your with your athletes um because you mentioned just before you know you end up with two of you ones at the top of uh, the circle um um i mean i would say otherwise you end up playing overload situations towards the goal for the rest of the year which is actually the opposite of our game because usually you would take in an underload situation or we say on the low but minus one or whatever um fewer numbers um so i mean yeah i would say have you been defending throughout the year have you been focusing on passing have you been focusing on receiving and and just in a way tick tick those boxes so at least you've covered everything and um and secondly um but you were talking about sustainability and and for me, as soon as we start to talk about sustainability, um, personally, as a coach, we start to talk about behavior. Um, um, behavior is always sustainable because sport is a great mean to, to teach or, yeah, grow future character, you know. Um, so so um, if, you connect, if you connect what you're doing on the turf to, to future behavior, I think your approach as a coach becomes even stronger. And I think one of the things, like we're sort of shifting a bit from the the, the basic skill stuff, but I think the the good teams that I see that have an environments where players are free to sort of, I guess, use their strengths and build or contribute to that sort of way of play are principles based, um, which is sort of what you were alluding to, Jamie. Where it's like, you know, we we're a part we we're a team that has a passing based offense it's the thing i talk about with my team and then it's like okay what does that mean support layer with you start building concepts into we want to use passing as our way of playing the game well how do we make that happen and then you know i talk about collective defensive effort and then that seems like a big broad yeah sure that's of course but if you focus on those two things as the the criteria for how you value and play the game then you can build principles three or four underneath that for certain scenarios um, and then all of a sudden the players actually can be on the same page together and play together in a really simple way that's not oppressive and then of course we get back to the the technical the skill acquisition then within that framework we can actually then paste in the types of skills that are required to play that way um, you know you, you play a passing based offense then you've got to be able to receive to advantage you've got to have good off the ball awareness to know where your next pass is You've got to find a way to be able to, to search, to find passing angles, or spend minimal time on the ball and get it to the next person quickly. So all of a sudden, they're, they're technical things related to receiving and passing, and what are, what does that look like, which allows them to have real purpose with the types of technical things that they're working on, because there's a why that connects to the team. That, that's really cool. I, I think, you know, you know, even at a even at a very much an entry level or you know junior hockey can can still apply principles to their to their game. Um, so things around offensive passing and things like that, I, anyone can grab that, and then the level the level changes, but the the essence is the same. Um, so then you know that com- comes into again with your your session design and how those skills are going to buy into your overall team principles or um, the things that you the way that you want to play the game. So. Another really interesting kind of insight there, Butch, so cheers for that. Um, and I suppose that's probably another podcast talking about principles Yeah, there's a, there's a uh, or, great or game principle style. There's a great FIH workshop at the moment that's just about principles of play and it talks you through how, how they design that and why. And um, it's so it's a really cool thing that listeners can look for. Um, that's out every few weeks, FIH run that. Um, but I think... Also, with what you're saying, Jamie, it allows you to have purpose. It's a bit of a blueprint, even though it's not a, it's not in detail and this is how it is. You can plan your year and your sessions inside those things because you know everybody knows how you're trying to play and how you're trying to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just again, gets that collective buy-in from the group and understanding. It like creates a big, uh, a, a greater understanding of of what you're trying to do. Uh, I think. <clears throat> I've been guilty of it, and I know probably a lot of the listeners have been guilty of it as kind of over-coaching situations. Um, so, you know, when the ball goes here, you've got to do this, and you've got to get here, and this player's got to be there. But, again, that ties back to what we said right at the start of the podcast around just too much information means that the players are going to lose their minds. Um, they're just, wow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, 
applying principles like that really kind of helps simplify it. And, you know, for me as a player, I only have to think about two things is, you know, offensive passing and collective defending, you know, that's really easy for me to, to kind of grapple with and, and buy into. So it's very nice. All right. So what we might do, is we might wrap that up there, guys. So I'm just going to go over uh, some of our key points that we have touched on. So first of all, we're talking about uh, coaching the fundamentals. And um, what some of the nice words that we used were just creating breadcrumbs along along the way for those players to guide them along their exploration and, and skill acquisition. Um, as I just mentioned, too much too much individual or very technical information like hands here, left foot here, ball must be there, shoulder there can just cause an, a mental overload and, and mean that the player is too worried about getting every little thing right. Um, so breadcrumbs are a nice way to, to do that. Um, Mark, you spoke about asking them a, a few questions around uh, the skills that they're uh, looking to complete. So if it was hitting, what, what would it be like if you did this? What would it be like if you did that? Those kind of questions so that you can actually allow that player to explore those things and, and come up with solutions themselves, which are obviously going to mean that they uptake a lot more because they came up with the answers or they experienced the answers themselves. Uh, Butch, really nice uh, little uh, analogy for you about having some couple non-negotiables and then having variant components so that you can allow for creativity and individualism. Um, we spoke about uh, incidental repetition um, and in our, in our uh, session design having elements of time on task, fun, decision making and challenge. Um, and then we also moved along to making sure that you've got a few modifiers in your toolkit so that if things aren't quite going the way you wanted them to go or they're too easy or difficult, you can change those on the fly. And uh, also just being a little bit flexible around that um, with, with your active coaching in your session. Uh, finally, we kind of started talking a little bit about vulnerability and making mistakes. Um, you know, being chucking yourself out there and, and being a human in front of your group just shows that you are human and that's just a really nice leadership style to have. Uh, and, and I think we should promote that with our young coaches to, to, be, to be vulnerable and be genuine with their team so that they, they understand that, you know, you're in the same boat, you're all on the same waka and you can, you can kind of get further that way. So really nice little thing there. And then finally, we spoke about uh, a little bit about coaching principles and how that might be a, an effective way for us to get a collective buy-in from our team in a simple way. Um, and I feel like that's something we can explore further in future podcasts. Uh, was there anything I missed there, guys, or was that not too bad? Oh, you've captured it very well, Jamie. I, I like the comment you made um, about the trust when, we, when you're talking through that and, and being vulnerable, but I think it's also honesty. You know, people, players, um, whatever it is, they when they feel like their leaders are being honest with them, even when it's not great. Um, and I know from my experience being a subordinate, or whatever, I think it's a really important message for coaches and, and leaders that be vulnerable. Yep. Yeah, but if you want real trust, you've got to be honest. And you just, sometimes it's even the hard conversations, you just got to chew on it together because um, when, when honesty goes away or people are uncertain or unsure, then everything starts to um, become fragmented. Yeah, really nice point. Mark, anything else to add from you, mate? I, d I did learn in New Zealand, though, that you can only be honest if you feel the proper uh, connection, though. So um, uh, j just to add, because if you start to be honest from uh, scratch on, then um, that, that might harm the relation. But, um, yeah, I mean, completely agree for the rest. Um, yep. Yeah. Relationships are key, right? Yep. Very good. Oh, well, hopefully everyone enjoyed that um, little touch on fundamentals and some of the, the little key nuggets of information that you can take away and start having a play with yourself. Uh, enjoyed talking to you guys again, as we always do. Looking forward to our next catch up soon. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks a lot for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Hockey New Zealand Exploring Coaching Podcast. We encourage you to take the time and identify a couple of things that resonated with you that you can apply to your own coaching practice. We look forward to having you on board for our next podcast too, so keep an eye on the Hockey New Zealand website for more information.